Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Mini Tribes One Kingdom. It's your good friend John here with today's video, and we are actually covering another theologian of history today. And this is Ulrich Zwingli, and I actually consider this guy the forgotten reformer. He was active during the same time as Luther. In fact, he had interactions with Luther, but we don't really talk about him too much. I actually didn't even know who he was until a few years ago. So, I'm sure you're dying to know who he is. Without further ado, let's get into his life and his contributions to theology. But before we do that, if you guys are new and you enjoy this content, please hit that subscribe button. It gives us encouragement to continue to spread the word of God through this medium. And if you're a returning subscriber, welcome back. We're very happy to have you. All right, Ulrich Zw Zwingli was born January 1st, 1484. He was the son of a farmer in the Alps, which is in Switzerland. I don't have a map of Europe, I apologize. He became a priest in 1506. Now, Zwingli took his role as a priest very seriously. He cited that answers for the flock would be required of him by God. So God would want to know what Zwingli had done for the flock that he was in charge of. He was greatly attracted to the scriptures, wanting to know everything about them, and wanting to make sure that all doctrine lined up with the scripture. Zwingli made it a point to study the New Testament in its original Greek, the original language it was written in, instead of Latin, which was the language endorsed by the Roman Catholic Church. He would also spend time learning Hebrew for the Old Testament, and he would spend his time studying the church fathers, the early church fathers, which is something I can relate to. I spent many hours doing this myself. Zwingli opposed many of the unbiblical practices Rome required at that time, such as celibacy for priests and images in the church and the Bible not being available to the everyday person. One of Zwingli's biggest issues was with the requirement that priests remain celibate and not get married. In fact, he would actually admit that because of this, he would actually have an affair during his early years. And of course, Swingley is not a perfect man. None of us are. We, are. we are only men perfected by Christ. Zwingli would eventually stand up against the celibacy demanded of him, and he would secretly marry Anna Reinhardt in 1522. And this is around the time when his reformation in Switzerland gets started. So in 1523, he would hold two disputations, and he would see a lot more success than Martin Luther did. If you know the history of Martin Luther, he didn't see much success when he had his disputations. But Zwingli, on the other hand, had a lot of success. The city council permitted many reforms to go through. Some of the most important being removing the idols and images that were present in the churches. And the Bible was given proper eminence as the word of God. The Bible was shown its proper respect. In 1524, he was married publicly to Anna, so they were married in 1522 in secret, but then in 1524, he felt comfortable enough to come right out and say, this is my wife, we will get married publicly now. 1525 is when Zwingli really stands out on his own compared to some of the other reformers, insisting that the Lord's Supper is a symbolic meal representing Christ's sacrifice and not an actual bloody presentation of Christ after crucifixion, as the Roman Catholic Church claimed, or as something where Christ was spiritually present, as Martin Luther claimed. And actually, this is where he, he and Luther would clash. They would meet in 1529... And while they would agree on much of their doctrines of the Reformation, I believe it said 14 out of 15 points they agreed on. However, the German and Swiss Reformations would remain separate, separated from one another due to their disagreement on the Lord's Supper. Both rejected transubstantiation, which if you don't know what that is, it is a Roman Catholic doctrine that, talks, that says that the bread and wine are actually transformed into the blood and body of Christ. They both rejected this because it's not biblical. However, Zwingli held that it was merely a symbolic meal meant to remind people of Christ's sacrifice, while Luther held that Christ was present in the bread and wine. Ulrich Zwingli actually wrote a lot of stuff. I've never read any of his stuff myself. I plan to once this semester is over. He would die on October 11th, 1531, defending his home against Catholic soldiers. So let's talk about his theology and what he's remembered for. He's remembered as 
one of the leaders in the Swiss Reformation. And here are his seven major points that he made it a point to talk about. These were where he said these things need to be reformed. Number one, that only Christ is head of the church. He said it's not the Pope. It's not some man here on earth. It's not anyone here on earth. Only Christ. Number two, church laws should only be binding if they agree with scripture. This was a big issue during the day because there were many church laws that actually either didn't come from scripture or blatantly contradicted scripture. And Zwingli said, no, this cannot be the case. Number three, Christ alone is man's righteousness. Man cannot earn righteousness on his own, but has to be given it by Christ. Number four, scripture does not teach that Christ is actually present in the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. This is true because Jesus was sacrificed once for all and is not continually sacrificed. And that actually leads into his next point. Mass is an affront to the sacrifice of Christ. Zwingli held that to say that you had to continue to offer mass, a continuous sacrifice, was in blatant disregard of what Christ had already accomplished for man. It was an insult to him, a gross affront, he actually called it. Then there was no biblical foundation for mediation or intercession of the dead, purgatory, or images and idols. These were a lot of, these were a big problem during Zwingli's day. There were extortionists who were using unbiblical concepts, concepts like purgatory to extort money out of people. And there were images and idols in practically every church. And Zwingli said, no, this is against scripture. And his last major point, marriage is lawful for all. Zwingli wanted to make sure that priests were allowed to get married as well. And this is good. We can read how Peter was married. We can read how many of God's faithful servants have been married throughout history. And Zwingli wanted to make sure that there was no for, nothing forbidding priests from getting married. And his most famous quote, or at least this is what I consider his most famous quote, and this one is actually very interesting. It really gives us a full insight into Zwingli's mindset. It says, for God's sake, do not put yourself at odds with the word of God. For truly it will persist as surely as the Rhine follows its course. One can perhaps dam it up for a while, but it is impossible to stop it. This gives us a full insight into Ulrich Zwingli. He wanted it to be scripture alone. His point was that only scripture should define the Christian life. No doctrines, no teachers, only scripture was the final authority that was infallible. And I think we can learn a lot from this. As I said at the beginning of this video, Zwingli is the forgotten reformer. You know, we all know about Luther and Calvin and Knox, but we don't know anything about Zwingli, really. And if I'm wrong about that, please let me know down in the comments. If you already knew who Ulrich Zwingli was, I'd love to know what your thoughts on him are. If I left something out, I'd love to hear it. Or if you just now figured out who he is, I'd love to know your thoughts on him. What did you enjoy hearing about him? All right. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you all have a great and blessed day and may God bless all of you.